how would I structure a program for a team sport athlete that has a 12 to 16 week off season? Uh, so let's assume 12 weeks. Uh, so now the thing with 12 weeks, it's long enough to create changes, but it's still quite short. You know, unlike the NFL, for example, that you can have like a 24 weeks of off-season training. So you can truly have a very solid general preparation phase and then a very solid specific preparation phase because you have enough time. But with 12 weeks, everything needs to be condensed. So the way you do it is you split that duration in half. So uh, if you're using 12 weeks, so you're going to have two six-week uh, macros and then if it's 16 weeks you're gonna have two eight week macros and then the first six weeks so what you do is uh, this first six week you're focusing on general preparation so general preparation what that means is the training session so assuming a upper one lower one upper two lower two split which is typically what I do with team sport athletes uh, you would have training programs with a lot of like more unilateral components, uh, more remedial exercises, working all on all the potential weakness of the sport. Like if it's ice hockey, uh, with the foot being in a in a skate and the the lack of uh, range of motion at the ankle, like you might focus on a lot of calf work during that time, a lot of like isolated lower back work with the back extensions and seated good mornings and stuff like that. So you just make sure that you address all the potential weakness that the sport can lead to uh, at a lower average intensity and you're actually focusing more on the hypertrophy um, realm of the continuum in terms of hypertrophy metabolic and neural in intensity on the continuum. So you're building that base. Uh, so I would do two phases here. So first, first phase, which would be an accumulation phase within the confine of your GPP. Uh, you know, like it could be depending on the level of the athlete, if he's more entry level or a little bit more advanced, it could be anywhere from 12, 10, or maybe eight reps for that first phase for your primary movements. Then mesocycle number two, so week four, five, and six, now you're doing the intensification phase of your GPP. So now the intensity goes up, but it's gonna go up in context of a GPP. So it's not like it's gonna be an abrupt increase in intensity. It might be like, you know, five, five to eight percent maybe top maximum. Now you're doing, uh, again, the same type of approach where you have a lot of multifaceted exercises, a lot of unilateral, a lot of remedial. Now, moving on to the specific preparation phase. At this point, now the training has to focus, it needs to have more of a power uh, component to it. So you're gonna use more like um, power methods, like you could use contrast training, you could use complex training. Uh, you can start introducing Olympic lifting variations. Um, you can start using like reactive strength method, uh, explosive strength methods, starting strength method. So now you just have to keep in mind that the next six weeks, the power output, well, strength and power becomes the main element. You still use a upper one, lower one, upper two, lower two split. At this point during the SPP as well, you start introducing uh, conditioning training. Uh, I like to use for most team sports athletes, I love using... Uh, modified strongman workouts because I find that you can get a, can get a good general um, energy system improvement but the strongman exercises helps transfer the strength that you're building in the weight room into more functional more usable strength that they will able to transfer into their sport because the problem with energy system training for athletes the only way you're truly going to make energy system training very specific is by doing the exact sport you're playing. If you're a hockey player, you would need to train the energy system on the ice. But the problem is most of us as professional strength coaches, if we only have a contract with an athlete during the off season, a lot of us don't have access to ice. And not only that, 
we only have access to their off season. Now the problem is after their off season, they're going to training camp, they have the preseason, so that's their pre-competitive season, which is normally when the conditioning needs to become hyper-specific. And by default, when they go back to their team, that's when they start skating and doing all these things. So the specificity of the energy system is already done by the team. Now the off season, I like to have more general energy system training with the modified strongman to improve the athleticism of the athlete. But although I'm doing the energy system in the SPP, you have to understand that the actual uh, energy system training is not that specific, but it's okay because it's the same thing with the weight room. No, it doesn't matter how you put it, uh, the weight room will never be fully specific to the sport either, okay? And it's just more why we call it a specific preparation phase. It's simply because the velocities now, they have the velocities and some of the angles of the prime mover need to start resembling a little bit more the ones from the sport, but it's never truly going to be the same thing because you're in a weight room, okay? Uh, so that's how you would do it. So now you're, you're, you keep on going. Accumulation one of your um, SPP, three weeks. So like uh, the average intensity of the SPP will be much higher than the average intensity of the GPP. It's about 10% higher, uh, typically speaking. But that first phase will be a lower intensity than the last phase. Um, so this is how you do it. Now the last phase, you, you want to you want to make sure that you're training at least at above 85% of your uh, 1RM, so like five reps or less typically for that last phase with most team sport athlete. Um, so th generally speaking, this is how the off season should be built. Chin up or chin down when deadlifting or squatting. Uh, personally, um, neither. I'm a fan of <clears throat> keeping the, uh, the cervical, so the neck, and it's in its neutral position. So if chin down, the neck is tilted forward, chin up, the neck is still tilted back, I think either or, either one of these situations is not ideal. <clears throat> so to me, if you're squatting and or deadlifting and the head always stays neutral to the body, always stays in place as you're moving, that's the best situation. One thing I always say though, is with your eyesight, with your eyes, like you fix a point that's right in front of you before you start at a distance, you fix it, and then you try to look at that point the whole time. What's gonna happen is this will help you have more of that neutral um, neck position. If you don't, if, you go, if you're looking all over the place, your, your, your head tends, your body tends to go where your eyes go. So if you look down, you will be looking down, the chin will be tucked in. If you look up, you will be looking up with the chin tilted back. Uh, so to me, if you look straight in front, it usually allows you to have more of a neutral position. So how do I periodize the three interval routines from our conditioning guide? Uh, it's very simple. So this conditioning guide, the work to rest intervals that you have there, like the three options, they're very good for your general population client that is looking to improve cardiovascular fitness in general, and also to increase fat loss potential. So that's pretty much what these work to rest ratios are for. And the thing is, like I like to start with the 30-30, which is a one-to-one -one ratio. You're kind of building that uh, aerobic power um, base. And then, you, so you could do an entire phase here. So however long your strength training phases are, you can do that work to rest ratio uh, with your conditioning workouts for the duration of that training phase. Now, as, as you switch, then you can move on to the 2010, and then finally you can move to the 3060, which now it's more on the anaerobic lactic capacity with a one to two uh, ratio. And what's interesting is, although this one on paper might look like it's the easiest interval, it's actually the hardest because what happens is compared to the 30-30, for example, the 30-30, the rest interval is so short that you don't have time to recover fully. So that second bout of 30 seconds will never be as intense as the first one. So the intensity keeps dropping a little bit. 
Now with the 3060, that 60 second, now it allows you to replenish way more so that now the second bout of 30 seconds is way more intense. And because you're able to maintain a higher intensity throughout the reps, you will produce a higher level of lactate. So that's why I like to progress it that way. You kind of build your base and then you go all the way to try to produce as much lactate as possible. Then you can just go back to 30, 30, 20, 10, 30, 60, 30, 30, 20, 10, 30, 60. So these like plan in this way, it works well, but they're very general. They're just going to improve like cardiovascular fitness and um, uh, lactic acid buffering capacity. So very good big bang for your buck for fat loss. So the question is on deadlift, I'm, the, the person is unable to do five reps per set with an intensity anywhere above 80%. Uh, so what is the problem? So that, that's the question. Uh, the answer, I mean, it's very normal, okay? Uh, I talked about this in the previous um, episode, but the thing about the deadlift, and now I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to assume that this person performs a deadlift the way that I like it to be performed, so a conventional deadlift with a 4-1-X-0 tempo, meaning that you do your eccentric four seconds, you're resetting onto the ground, rebracing, pulling again. What happens is when you do it with this fashion, now re keep in mind that basically with compound movements, uh, if we look at the 1RM continuum, 80% is seven reps, okay? But like I said in the previous episode, the problem with deadlift is deadlift is one of these lifts that because of the dead stop component and because of the large demand on the energy substrates because every freaking muscle is used, what happens is everybody on the intensity perspective will never perform as many reps as they would with another compound lift. It's just the nature of the lift. Okay, so 80% it's typically seven reps. 85% is five reps. But the person says that every time they use 80 or over, they cannot do five reps. That's normal. Okay, so I like to say that typically 12 reps, which is 70%, most people on deadlift with 70% of 1RM are only going to be able to do six, maybe seven reps. So it, with that in mind, it's very normal that at 80%, you're, you can't perform seven reps, it's even more, and it's also normal that you can't really perform five reps. Okay, that's fine. Like most people at 80% on deadlift, uh, they will be able to do maybe four, three or four reps at the top. That's just the nature of the lift. So don't, don't worry about it, it's extremely normal, okay? If you want to do more than five reps, you're gonna have to go lower than uh, 80%.